Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. A couple weeks ago with the release of this video I began to explore the group 2A elements namely beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium and barium. In that video I initially focused on the need to invoke partial redistribution in order to account for the line shape of the most prominent chromospheric lines. At the end of the video I presented this figure to explain how the line shapes in magnesium 2 can only be properly accounted for by invoking partial redistribution. You may recall that complete redistribution could not account for the line shape. Of course complete redistribution occurs when the emitted photon has no relationship whatsoever with the absorbed photon in terms of frequency, direction and polarization. In that case the two photons are completely uncorrelated. In partial redistribution the emitted photon is somehow correlated to the absorbed photon whether in terms of frequency, direction of emission or polarization. The two photons are partially correlated. The central lesson in that video was that the chromospheric densities advanced by the standard solar model are much too low. In the laboratory I explained that partial redistribution only occurs under one of two conditions either extreme densities namely densities on the order of 10 to the 20th or 10 to the 25th particles per centimeter cubed or at plasma edges within tokamak reactors. In that case it is interaction of the plasma with condensed matter in the wall of the reactor which is the key concern not the fact that we are examining a plasma. Partial redistribution must also be utilized at times to treat the line shape of neutral atoms as we will be highlighting today. Therefore it is not strictly a process limited to ions in plasmas. Partial redistribution is a question of densities involved or the interaction of an atom with condensed matter. The need to invoke partial redistribution in order to account for the line shapes seen in the chromosphere is a sure sign that condensed matter is present there. In fact the conclusion is obvious when one considers the presence of spicules in this region of the sun. Now today we continue with our analysis of the group 2A elements. You recall that in the first video on the group 2A elements I had presented these tables summarizing the main transitions we will discuss. Together magnesium and calcium are responsible for well over 100 transitions taking place on the sun as one can learn in this paper. But the analysis is best served by focusing on just these few transitions and continuing with the singlet to singlet transitions for the neutral atom. For the Fraunhofer these transitions are much less broad than those noted previously for the calcium 2 or magnesium 2 H and K lines. Unfortunately the singlet to singlet transition for beryllium and magnesium occur in the ultraviolet. Those spectra were not readily available for analysis. However the spectra for the singlet to singlet transitions for calcium, strontium and barium are available as they occur in the optical range. The three relevant transitions as taken from the Paris Observatory digital database can be compared. Note the broadness of the calcium transition whereas both the strontium and barium lines are relatively sharp. Yet despite the broadness of the calcium 1 line the H and K lines of calcium 2 were much broader. Next examine the polarized spectrum for these transitions as presented by Gandorfer beginning with strontium and barium. Both of these are relatively sharp. However the calcium transition is the strongest polarized line in the optical by far as highlighted in the first video on the second solar spectrum. A degree of polarization of nearly 2.5 percent is reached. It remains unclear as to why this particular line versus all the others should be so strongly polarized in the sun. A definitive explanation has not been ascertained it seems nor do supportive findings exist in the laboratory. However a couple of things are certain. First the calcium atom is responsible for the most powerful lines both in the Fraunhofer spectrum through the calcium 2 H and K lines and in the second solar spectrum through the calcium 1 line at 4227 angstroms. This is not an accident and it reflects chemical selection not just random processes. Secondly the proper characterization of the wings of the calcium 1 4227 transition once again just like for the other strong chromospheric lines both in the Fraunhofer and in the second solar spectrum 
absolutely requires the use of partial redistribution, as one can learn in these papers. Here is a relevant quotation. The core of these signals can often be suitably modeled under the limit of complete frequency redistribution, CRD. However, this approximation turns out to be completely inadequate to model their extended wing lobes, for which a general approach accounting for partial frequency redistribution, PRD effects, is of the utmost importance. In this case, partial redistribution is required to analyze the neutral atom. Hence, the use of this approach is not restricted to ionic plasmas. But as noted previously, partial redistribution is not needed to treat the core of chromospheric lines. In this respect, the core of the calcium-1 line is extremely important in solar physics, measuring the strength of magnetic fields in the chromosphere using the Hanley effect, as one can learn in these four papers. The use of the Hanley effect to measure magnetic fields on the Sun was previously addressed when discussing the strontium K line in this video. At the time, it was noted that such methods are invalid because field measurements rest on known Einstein coefficients. The paper by Bestart et al. discusses the Hanley effect and the use of Einstein coefficients for spontaneous emission. The authors adopt a two-level atom approximation concentrating only on the upper energy level U and the lower energy level L involved in the transition. They write, the Einstein coefficient for spontaneous emission from the line's upper level angular momentum j sub u equals 1 and Landé factor g sub u equals 1 to the line's lower level angular momentum j sub l equals 0 is AUL equal 2.18 times 10 to the eighth per second. Of course, such an Einstein coefficient must be determined in a laboratory setting where there are no interatomic interactions. They continue. The critical magnetic field B sub H for the onset of the Hanley effect is 25 Gauss. B sub H approximately 1.137 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by T life GU. T life and GU being the lifetime of the upper level in seconds and its Landé factor respectively. Because collisional depolarization is not significant for the core of this line, there is no collisional quenching. For example, Alcina Ballister et al. 2018. Since the lower level has J sub L equals zero, the scattering polarization in this line is solely due to the radiatively induced atomic polarization of the upper level. That is, to the population imbalances and the quantum coherence between the magnetic sublevels of the line's upper level with J sub U equal one. In the equation contained in this quote, the lifetime of the upper energy level, T life, is actually simply the inverse of the Einstein coefficient. This is because there are only two energy levels being considered. But as mentioned in the previous video, solar physicists can never ascertain that the value of the Einstein coefficient obtained in the laboratory is related to the true value on the Sun. They could differ by orders of magnitude, which is not unlikely for an Einstein coefficient. Secondly, the core of the calcium-1 line at 4227 angstroms is believed to form at a height of 800 to 1000 kilometers above the continuum elevation as defined by the standard model. Just see the Bianda paper. But such height estimates depend on solar models. Bianda and Bestard both claim that the line is sensitive to fields in the range of 5 to 100 Gauss. Yet the problem remains that the Einstein coefficient utilized cannot be trusted as the calcium-1 atom may not be free at all from interatomic effects. We will return to the question of determining Einstein coefficients in a few minutes. For now, we turn to the spin-forbidden singlet to triplet transitions listed in this table. At the same time, here is the Grotrian diagram for magnesium as seen in the last video. On this diagram, both spin-allowed transitions in the solid white lines and spin-forbidden transitions in dashed lines are noted. Spin-allowed transitions are also known as electric dipole transitions in optical spectroscopy. Spin-forbidden transitions occur when the electron undergoing the transition changes its spin state as seen here. Such transitions always involve a change in the multiplicity of the term symbol. In this table, the multiplicity of the terms associated with the transitions changed from singlet to triplet. The multiplicity of a term symbol was discussed in the last video. In any event, if the multiplicity changes for a certain transition, the electron changed its spin state. But that is not allowed in electric dipole transitions. Of course, spin-forbidden transitions do occur in the Fraunhofer spectrum. These are seen even if they are weaker because other mechanisms can be involved in line formation. This includes either magnetic dipole or electric quadrupole mechanisms. Next, let us add laboratory determined Einstein coefficients to the table and to the Grotrian diagram for magnesium. 
Note that spin-allowed transitions typically have Einstein coefficients for spontaneous emission on the order of 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th per second. Conversely, spin-forbidden transitions typically have Einstein coefficients, which are much, much smaller, usually on the order of 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 5 per second. On the Grotrian diagram for magnesium-1, a total of four Einstein coefficients are provided as examples of spin-allowed transitions. In those cases, the Einstein coefficients are on the order of 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th per second as expected. There are three forbidden transition lines, but only two of these Einstein coefficients could be found in the NIST tables. Note that one is indeed very small at only 10 to the minus 4 per second. However, the coefficient for the forbidden singlet to triplet transition we are interested in is nearly six orders of magnitude greater. Nonetheless, it remains five or six orders of magnitude less than that for the allowed transitions. The singlet to singlet transition for magnesium had an Einstein coefficient of 4.91 times 10 to the eighth, while the singlet to triplet transition of interest had an Einstein coefficient of 2.54 times 10 to the second. Next, here are the spectra for the singlet to triplet spin forbidden transitions for beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. The beryllium transition was already presented in this video. Amongst this series, the line associated with magnesium is clearly the most powerful. That is one of the reasons why magnesium is believed to be more abundant on the sun than calcium, as we saw in this video. The magnesium line is depolarizing in the second solar spectrum, as one can see here. This line is also known to be highly sensitive to chromospheric structures, as seen in this paper. The question of Einstein coefficients introduced above can now be re-examined using this magnesium line at 4571 angstroms in order to ascertain how much variability exists in measuring this value in the laboratory. Here is a quote relative to the Einstein coefficient associated with the magnesium-1 4571 angstrom line. The value of the Einstein coefficient AJI for the 2-1 transition lambda 4571 angstroms is of particular importance in the present study. Our adopted value of 219 per second was taken from experimental work by Kwong, Smith, and Parkinson, which is in good agreement with the experiments by Mitchell, Fersenidi, Wright, and Balling, and with the available theoretical calculations, Garstang, Warner, Lolling, and Victor. The older experimental result by Bolt is larger by a factor of two. The lifetime measurements of Gersfidi et al. also gave a larger value, but it is believed that these measurements suffered from quenching. C. Fersenidi et al. Altrock and Canfield adopted the larger value of 450 per second. The quenching they mention in the quote relative to the Einstein coefficients makes the lifetime of the excited state shorter. Conversely, instead of destabilizing the upper energy level, some environmental interactions might act to stabilize metastable states. Such interactions would be responsible for increasing the lifetimes observed. The point is that there is tremendous variability in laboratory measurements of Einstein coefficients, and this variability has been attributed to experimental conditions. Quenching occurs when photons, electrons, or other factors, including cavity dimensions, enhances the value of the Einstein coefficient for spontaneous emission. Quenching effects have long been known to complicate laboratory measurements, as can be seen in these works. In this regard, I highlight the last paper listed. It is a phenomenal review of the problem and acts as a warning that chromospheric structures offer many opportunities to modify Einstein coefficients. In any event, astronomers cannot claim knowledge of Einstein coefficients in the chromosphere because they cannot be certain that these conditions match those in the laboratory. The chromosphere is neither like air nor vacuum. It possesses condensed matter, and as we noted in these videos, atoms and ions in the chromosphere are interacting with this material. This invalidates all attempts to measure magnetic fields with the Hanley effect. The question is not whether the magnetic fields are present. Surely they are. It is strictly a matter of never being able to ascertain their value using the Hanley effect. In the end, solar physicists have overplayed their hand relative to the use of this effect on the Sun. Finally, we come to the triplet to triplet transitions. These were selected because they arise after an electron has first executed the forbidden singlet to triplet transition just covered. Once again, the presence of the beryllium triplet to triplet transitions had been highlighted in this video, and here is the associated spectrum. Next, here are the magnesium triplet to triplet transitions. 
Note that all these lines are present in the second solar spectrum, but not particularly strong. As with the magnesium one, forbidden transition at 4571 angstroms, the magnesium triplet lines have been used extensively to monitor chromospheric activity as noted in this paper. The calcium triplet lines are rather strong in the Fraunhofer and are present in the second solar spectrum, but not particularly strong in that case. The triplet to triplet lines from strontium are very weak in the Fraunhofer spectrum, and the two that were sampled in the Gandorfer spectrum were not detected. As for the barium lines, they are barely detectable in the Paris Observatory Fraunhofer data, as one can see here. Unfortunately, they have not been sampled in the second solar spectrum, as presented by Gandorfer. Nonetheless, given the result with strontium, they would not be expected to be present. So in the end, relative to the triplet lines, remember that for magnesium and calcium, the lines are present and rather strong in the Fraunhofer. Conversely, they are modest in the second solar spectrum. Well, that is all for now. Our understanding of the solar chromosphere is far from complete. The case against the standard solar model of the chromosphere will continue to build as we explore more spectroscopic lines in this region of the sun. So if you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.